Hello, everybody. Welcome. Uh, I'm delighted uh, to welcome you this this, to this webinar hosted by the Wilberforce Institute at the University of Hull. Today's event uh, concerns Brexit and its impact on labour exploitation and modern slavery in the UK. As some of you may know, the 30th of June was the deadline for EU nationals living in the UK to apply for EU settlement status. Over five and a half million people have applied and just over 50% of these got the equivalent of indefinite leave to remain, which gives them the same rights to work as they had under EU free movement rules. However, over two million people who were in the UK less than five years were given pre-settled status and will have to reapply in the future. There are potentially several thousand more workers from across the EU who are eligible under the scheme but may have not applied, meaning that they have lost their right to work and live in the UK. And all of this is happening at the same time as we're seeing major labour shortages across the UK. A reported 500,000 EU nationals have returned home and we still have over one and a half million people on furlough as a result of COVID. The Association of Labour Providers, who we have here with us today, estimates that 78% of businesses do not expect to have a sufficient workforce this year. In farming in particular, this shortage of labour, coupled with massive wage hikes in some regions, could open the door to exploitation as companies increasingly turn to subcontracting workers to fill the gaps. So, we have an incredible panel of experts here today and we'll be asking them whether they think there has been an increase or a decrease in the risk of labour exploitation and modern slavery since the UK left the EU. I'm Christina Tannens and I'm the Head of Business Risk Assessment Services here at the Wilberforce Institute and I'm going to be a uh, chair this afternoon. So as a British and Spanish national, I'm, I'm personally delighted to be chair of this session today and to explore this question with our panel. This afternoon, we have uh, five presentations from individuals who are working on this very issue at a governmental level, across law enforcement, and within the food sector and business supply chains uh, more generally. We'll ask them to introduce themselves and then tell us what they think the impact of Brexit has been on the workforce and working conditions. And then I will then start with a series of questions uh, to start a discussion between them. During this time, you're all welcome to ask the panelists questions, which we'll ask you to send in uh, in writing in the questions tab. And you'll find this to the right of your screen. You can obviously submit your questions at any time, but we're going to save them until after their responses have been delivered. We think that there should be about 20 minutes at the end of the discussion to go through your questions. I'll be reading out the questions to the speakers because the platform that we have here today means that you in the audience can't be heard or seen. Given that we've got a lot of people here today, we may not be able to ask all of your questions, but any questions that we don't get through, we'll pass to the speakers at the end. So, as I said, we have five speakers here today, and our first speaker is Dame Sarah Thornton, who is the UK's Independent Anti-Slavery Commissioner. So she's responsible for encouraging good practice in the prevention and detection of modern slavery and the identification of victims. Sarah, would you like to introduce yourself and tell us whether you think there is an increased or decreased risk of labour exploitation and modern slavery following Brexit? Over to you, Sarah. Thank you, Christine. Good afternoon, everybody. And thank you to the Wilverpulse Institute for putting on this event this afternoon. Um, you've actually introduced myself, um, Sarah Thornton, the Independent <laughs> Anti-Slavery Commissioner. Um, that role is established under the Modern Slavery Act 2015. It's a statutory role independent of government. Um, of course, I have a role uh, in thinking and supporting the protection of victims and the prosecution of offences, but I also think work on preventing modern slavery and human trafficking is really important. And that's why I've got a real focus of my work on businesses and their supply chains. Uh, we've done a lot of work following uh, a substantial prosecution, uh, Operation Fort, uh, looking at how um, forced labour ended up in, being in tier one of all our major supermarkets uh, and DIY stores, and what more can be done to, to improve standards. And we've published two reports on that. At the moment, doing a lot of work in the financial services sector, looking at banking, um, looking at investors, looking at insurance, also thinking about illicit finance, and really trying to push for much better and consistent understanding of what does that S in ESG uh, really mean and how do we measure it. 
So in terms of the question that's being asked today, um, it seems to me we always knew that Brexit posed a high risk, that vulnerability to exploitation would be increased, whether that was because of the uh, EU settlement scheme, which you just mentioned, or the introduction of the new points-based system, there was always that potential. And I think already we're beginning to see examples of EU nationals being exploited as a consequence. So uh, very high risk, and I fear uh, that it might become an actuality. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Sarah, uh, for your insights and for joining us here today. Next, we have Shane Tyler, who is the Group Compliance Director at Fresca Group and the Director of the Anti-Slavery Network. So he's a supply chain modern slavery specialist and he's been working in this field for over 20 years and has experience of worker exploitation cases and um, their successful resolutions. So Shane, would you like to introduce yourself and tell us whether you see an increased or decreased risk as a result of Brexit? Over to you, Shane. Good afternoon and um, thank you um, Wilberforce Institute and Hall University for the invite today. Um, yeah, I've been, in, I've been involved in um, and aware of modern slavery for uh, over 21 years after um, it affected the factory that I was um, manager of um, when we were infiltrated by a criminal gang and I had over 200 workers working illegally and being paid as little as 17 pence per hour. Um, I couldn't realise that could happen in the UK, never mind in my facility. For the past 19 years, I've been employed by the Fresca businesses who supply fruit and veg to UK retail and wholesale markets, um, where our systems, training and collaboration has found hundreds of cases of exploitation, welfare and slavery issues um, that's affected many thousand workers. And we've provided remedy for every single one, with the exception of 53, which is a different story, um, for the past 19 years. To answer the question of whether Brexit or the Immigration Act has had um, a direct impact on the risk to victims, my view is I don't believe it's had a direct impact on victims of uh, um, uh, exploitation, but most definitely is having an indirect impact, which um, will be ever increasing um, as time progresses. The reason why I say this is the indirect impact is affecting businesses' supply chains significantly first through the shortage of labour and the Immigration Act 2016. That increased demand and the labour shortages is increasing desperation, which is in turn leading to shortcuts. We, this summer we have seen um, illegal working increasing both actually um, and attempted and infiltration of worker substitution, illegal student working and asylum seeking working, um, which is reminiscent of activity pre-2004. The increased difficulty um, is seen also as many of the potential victims in future of exploitation, the, the illegal workers apt to start with will be complicit because they won't be, they'll be hiding that from us in their own nature by the fact that they're, they're illegal. So it's gonna get very, very difficult and I anticipate it will get a lot harder before it gets easier. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that introduction, uh, Shane. Thank you for those insights. Um, next, we have David Camp, who heads up the Association of Labour Providers. And this is a trade body driving responsible recruitment and good labour practices in agriculture, food manufacturing and wider industry supply chains. So David, would you like to introduce yourself and tell us whether you see an increased or decreased risk as a result of Brexit? Over to you, David. Thanks, Christina. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so uh, the last year in the Association of Labour Providers, uh, we've been supporting um, recruiters and food industry and wider industry sectors to adapt to the new immigration system uh, following hot on the heels of uh, dealing with um, the challenges of the pandemic. Um, I've also, uh, with a separate hat on, been chairing a multi-stakeholder group working in the fast fashion sector um, to address the issues of uh, unethical fast fashion manufacturing in the UK and that works ongoing. Um, what have we seen as a consequence of the change to uh, the uh, immigration system in the UK? Well, um, 
let's look at what hasn't changed, which is the risk that undocumented workers are under. Um, unlike many other countries, uh, the UK uh, has virtually no employment protection rights for undocumented workers, and so they are most vulnerable to exploitation and modern slavery. It's something that um, rarely are there conversations around, and yet there are hundreds of thousands of undocumented workers in the UK who um, face choices of uh, using uh, high quality uh, forged documents, working in the informal economy or for friends and relatives, working for uh, unscrupulous employers or, um, uh, or, or facing uh, the option of turning to crime. I haven't seen a change to that as, uh, as a consequence of the new immigration system. What I have seen is um, uh, an increase in uh, the number of uh, individuals who would fall into that category um, because of the uh, change to the rules for EU workers. Um, we have seen six million apply for the EU settlement scheme. But there will be a significant number who haven't applied and uh, and were uh, confused by the rules that apply during the grace period. So there will be a number of EU workers now working without the legal right to do so. Uh, and of course, uh, with there being um, uh, high demand for lower skilled workers, uh, the greatest labour shortages that um, we've seen in a generation, um, then there is uh, um, many opportunities for there to be work, uh, but without um, uh, uh, for EU workers, but who don't actually have the legal right to work, therefore putting themselves at risk of um, control and exploitation. The additional factor we've seen uh, through the new immigration system is the points-based system. This has opened up work opportunities for skilled work in the UK globally. Over 30,000 employers have the right to recruit globally into the UK. The consequences we've seen of that is a growth in online recruitment scamming, a growth in overseas employment agencies promising making false promises, charging high fees uh, to workers. Um, what we don't know about, but what we would expect is uh, for organised criminal gangs to infiltrate point point space system. Not seen that yet, and, um, but uh, I'm pretty sure at some stage we will see the consequence of that. So, Christine, that's, uh, that's, that's what we've seen. Um, hopefully uh, that covers my point and I'll... Uh, I'll, I'll pass on to the next speaker. Okay, thank you very much, David. Thank you for that. Um, next, we have Mel Miles, who unfortunately, I don't think we can get in person on the camera, but he's here in the conference. He's uh, head of human rights at Green Corps and a member of the Food Network for Ethical Trade. So Mel has been working within the food sector for many years, I'm not quite sure how many years, but many years. Mel, would you like to introduce yourself and tell us whether you see an increased or decreased risk as a result of Brexit? Over to you, Mel. Hi, Christina, and hello, everyone. Uh, thanks very much for allowing me to speak today. So, yes, I have been working in the food industry for some time. Um, I first started working for a, a gang master in 1984. Um, and that was an individual who uh, didn't pay me or any of his workers and absconded with um, our earnings. So that was an interesting introduction to the sector that we're in. I represent a business called Green Corp, and we are a, a PLC, a food manufacturer in the UK with a number of manufacturing facilities. And those are spread across the country and we employ something like 12 to 15,000 colleagues. To put it simply, I think that the risks have increased significantly. That's risk, which is different to, to fact or practice. The reason I think the risks have increased is because of the tremendous uh, change and evolution 
in supply chains. We're seeing incidental issues um, such as businesses just struggling to cope, not just to do with what you read in the press around um, red tape and rules, but the simple coping of not having enough workers, not having enough drivers, not having enough raw materials. And when businesses are stressed, poor decisions are made. And business leaders and business managers will assume that labor's not a moral or a legal issue. They'll treat it as a practical one of numbers. I just need enough numbers to, to help my business survive and function till tomorrow. And as soon as you start thinking about people in that way, I think the writing's on the wall in terms of exploitation. I think it's an inevitability. I, I fear that the risks have increased because I fear that it's now much more tempting here in September 2021 for criminals to deliberately um, target our sector and exploit the vulnerable. I think that there's greater profit for would-be exploiters. I think there's the likelihood of much less scrutiny because of the issues I just mentioned. Um, and fundamentally, we're dealing in a post-Brexit environment with a much more vulnerable cohort of workers. We're looking at people who now have a fear of deportation, who may be fully aware that they don't have a clear legal right to be where they are, in their homes, in their workplace, and a real fear therefore of authority. So as an employer, we're gonna find it much harder to speak to people and find out what's going on in their lives. And for enforcement bodies, I'm afraid that it's going to be much, much harder. So without wanting to be all doom and gloom, I think the current context is one of tremendous volatility, vulnerability, fear, and the potential for organized exploitation, um, which really is gonna roll the clock back many decades and be a significant challenge for us all. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. You paint, you paint a quite worrying picture. Um, okay, thank you, Mel. So uh, finally, we have Daryl Dixon, who is uh, responsible for the Gang Masters Licensing Authority's future strategy. So he is the GLAA lead on the development of a single enforcement body and leads on the international exchange agreements uh, for cross-border operations. Um, so Daryl, would you like to introduce yourself and tell us whether you see an increased or decreased risk as a result of Brexit? Um, Thank you. Over to you, Darren. Thank you, Christina. Uh, and I think, uh, like Sarah said earlier, um, you've done the introduction very well. So there's not a lot to, to say in terms of background on what, what I'm what I'm doing what uh, currently. Um, so really uh, into the into the issue in question, and, and do we think that there has been an increased risk? Yes, and I think it's in several different ways, really. Um, if we've got workers in the country that have not uh, gone through the EUSS settlement scheme or onto the pre-settled scheme and don't know what their rights are, then they are more prone to being exploited because they just don't know how to uh, get their legal entitlements. Uh, and one of the risks that will come with that, I think, is, um, uh, is the fact that as they are then illegal workers, um, they are part of a criminal offence and are not wanting to um, identify that, that they've been involved in such offences, if you like, because they may fear that they'll be deported rather than protected as victims. And the risk that that takes is that they may be less likely to self-identify uh, than, than we may have experienced in the past. And our experience has always been that workers, and particularly male workers, uh, in the in labour exploitation are, are not great at coming forward and are very reticent to self-identification. So in the post-Brexit world, where those workers may now be illegal and may now be exploited if they weren't before, um, because they are part, of, you know, potentially committing a, sort of partly uh, an immigration offence, they're certainly going to be less likely to uh, self-identify and that means that the exploitation could become more entrenched that's one thing the other thing of course is that when you look at some of the things occurring at the moment like the seasonal workers scheme where workers are being recruited from outside the EU uh, that raises a different risk for us so it's an indirect risk of Brexit in one sense and that is that if we now see workers being recruited through different supply chains to the UK from outside the EU 
uh, we don't know what the labor law situation is in the country of origin. We don't know whether, for example, they've found, uh, had to pay work finding fees, which you know we don't support and don't accept and is illegal, uh, but it may be in the country of origin. We don't know, therefore, how they're being treated in that recruitment or whether it's deceptive and whether uh, the, the, co the companies that may recruit them in those other countries as subcontractors for UK businesses uh, may, um, w whether the way they operate may be understood in the UK and therefore those workers may be exploited. We may need to liaise with the authorities in those countries to try and uh, establish that, but we don't know the, the labour laws in those wider set of countries. We don't know those authorities and we don't have the personal contacts that we currently have with the, with the, with the REU counterparts. Um, and one of the things that we're going to lose out on, uh, although we're trying to maintain our links uh, with our colleagues uh, across labour inspectorates and the police with, uh, through our U Europol forum, is of course that uh, at the same time as we left the EU, um, the, the EU set up the European Labour Authority as a hub for improving the cross-border relationships between the EU member states. So we're going to miss out on that. Um, and then finally, uh, if we think about uh, operations and cases such as Sarah's already mentioned Operation Fort, um, sometimes the offences against the workers can take quite a considerable time to actually develop uh, for us to get the information on to realise there's an offence and to investigate that. Um, so even though we've left the EU, uh, it's not as if today we no longer need the contact with our European uh, uh, opposite numbers in other inspectorates because we may need those in three or four years when offences that are occurring now that relate to workers that perhaps have joined, come to the UK in the last two or three years, finally come to uh, come to the surface. So we do need to continue to maintain our, our sort of like um, direct links with those and certainly from my own experience recently I'm running about three or four uh, uh, information requests and liaison with our Romanian counterparts at the moment. So there are different, a range of different um, ri risks, I think, uh, entrenched exploitation, possibly less likely to self-identify, uh, also increasing risks from uh, workers coming to us from other countries, and of course the need to maintain our relationships with our opposite numbers because of uh, exploitation that may not have come to the surface yet but may have been uh, occurring for a couple of years so far. Okay, thank you very much, Daryl, um, for that really useful introduction. Um, I, I will just get everybody on um, the screen, if that's if that's possible, for everybody to come on the screen, if you can switch your cameras on. Uh, for the people with the slides, uh, not to worry. Um, so thank you very much for those introductions. Um, I suppose my first question, then following up from, from Daryl's um, introduction, is, is to uh, Sarah Thornton. So, um, Daryl's just mentioned that people will, you know, even EU nationals will probably find it, you know, be less likely to self-identify as being exploited or in situations of modern slavery. So do you do you feel or do you think that we will find ourselves with an increasing number of EU nationals in situations in situations of exploitation or modern slavery as a result of what everybody said? Colleagues have already talked about uh, two of the structures which pose different sorts of threats. Um, the EU settlement scheme, uh, you know, in many ways has been a great success. Lots of people have successfully applied, but there are two million people who are on pre-settled status, and we're concerned about their ability to uh, make sure that they um, step up to the settled status, that they are able to uh, change uh, in the right time um, for all sorts of practical reasons. So, so there's a concern about people in that group and who might end up by default uh, working illegally. But we're still concerned, and I think it was the point that you made, Christina, that there will be EU citizens in this country for whom, for whatever reason, whether that's language issues or just not understanding, despite all the communication from the Home Office, have just not applied for settled status. So I think that's that's a concern. But but the other point that was made, and it was I was really worried to hear what Shane was saying about what they're already seeing. But we were always concerned about the points-based system and the, the focus on tier two visas. Um, of course, that, that's fine, that there is an issue about whether, um, you know, 
the increased number of employers who are using tier two visas, you know, does that jeopardize standards? There's all sorts of suggestions that there might be clawback, that you make the salary look higher, but in fact, actually, it's clawed back by the employer. But I think the bigger concern is that at the moment, it's very uh, easy to go through those e-gates uh, at the border uh, with nobody checking who is coming in and who is uh, uh, leaving and people either wittingly or unwittingly um, working illegally and the point that you made about students uh, over the summer is a real concern that if you're finding that on the ground that was always the risk that we had and we kept saying to border force and to immigration enforcement um, how are you going to monitor this because there's real potential to increase vulnerability because once people are here working illegally uh, then I'm afraid they are absolutely uh, open to exploitation. Uh, mm. Home Office have responded to a certain extent, there has been communication, but I think that big question about, you know, are we going to end up with many more undocumented workers, irregular workers in this country, uh, hasn't been answered to my satisfaction. And I, I, at the moment, I can only conclude that we will, and that group of undocumented workers will be uh, very vulnerable to exploitation. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, Shane, would you like to just come back on that? What actions are you taking as a result, as a business, at the business? Well, the, the, the actions have been multiple because um, the illegal work is just a, um, just a part of some of the things that we've seen over the summer. Um, the, the, this summer has been completely different to last summer, being in lockdown, because there was a massive excess of labour last year. And the issues last year were all about welfare of workers. We had too many workers for the work available. And we were struggling with people not able to feed themselves and look after themselves. And then there was a leading to a large number returning um, back to their countries um, back end of last year. Since the Immigration Act um, came in, in in the new year, the business desperation for workers and the restricted routes for those uh, for the recruitment of workers has changed a number of recruitment models. So we've seen um, payment for work in a Bulgarian and Romanian model. We've seen a Ukrainian one, which is slightly different, and a North Macedonian one, again, which is slightly different. Um, so um, there's some issues that are ranging there as they're starting to become more and more diverse. We're also seeing compliance regulatory increase of uh, exploitation. So the fact that people need to come over on seasonal worker scheme and have over two, £1,200 in their bank, well, these people that are minimum wage workers that are travelling several thousand miles, well, they're borrowing money to, to meet the process of coming over, which places them in a level of vulnerability, which we've seen. Um, we're seeing things like people not getting national insurance numbers so therefore, to leave the country and get their tax back, they have to be paid their tax in a government cheque rather than into a bank account. And as a result, they to cash that cheque, they get taxed, if you like, another 10 percent because they don't get the full value of their, their cheque back. It's all these little things where they, there's little costs coming out of the most vulnerable in our supply chain. Um, the misinformation is lead, has given us a little bit of concern. We're starting to see a number of people that are suggesting that they believe that there's new visas coming and therefore they're telling family members they can come over and they can get work. There's plenty of work here. There's a desperation. So, um, and I've heard three that three times now. So it's still anecdotal, but that's given me concern if that misinformation is encouraging people um, to come over. But in terms of what actions we've taken, it's it's very difficult because the 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 changes are um, so much outside of our influence because the elimination and the substitution of the risk we don't have control of. All we can do is react through um, our mitigation of what we can do to um, manage and mitigate that risk. So it's about managing our risk assessments. It's about um, uh, getting the information to our supply chain, to our workers, um, ensuring that we've got that training to the lowest level. So that feedback is coming through. But it's extremely difficult. And the illegal working part is making it very worrying because, you know, having workers trying to find work in South Lincolnshire when they're Coventry work students or people that are turning up as workers substitution, as we had last Friday, where they're not even the people that they purport to be because the legal people have gone and got the job and the illegal ones are turning up to do the day's work. That's very difficult to spot when you're in the middle of a field in South Lincolnshire. 
that's what I'm really worried about because yeah. once it's in, very hard to get out. Absolutely, that would be worrying. Mel, are you finding something similar with your with the with the farmers or the food supply chains? Would you do you agree with Shane that this, these are kind of the things that are going on? It's um, it's really interesting hearing Shane's experience there. Um, we are in slightly different parts of the food supply chain in that Green Core aren't a farming business, we're a processing business. But we do see a definite similarity of pattern. So the macro environment that people have described, Dame Sarah, Daryl, you know, David, we're kind of at the the mercy of this macro environment. And the, the current context is one of tremendous um, turbulence. So we've never seen such high turnover of workers. And what, what we're seeing here is a cohort of people who are um, primarily at the moment from Romania and Bulgaria with very poor educational skills, a real reticence to speak to authority. Um, and by authority, I would include anyone within the company's management structure whatsoever and a, a total lack of knowledge regarding their legal rights um and this wasn't the mixed case in before? with common vulnerabilities around um, alcohol and drug dependence it's a different scale it's a completely different scale partly driven by the pace of change so if i if i explain that we're we're seeing people join the company um and go and join the company and go at such a rate, you know, within a few days, that tracking um, exploitation and vulnerability is very difficult. We may become aware of a house of multiple occupancy and start to investigate. By the time we get there, it's shut down, the people have gone, they're in a different company. We may start to get some intelligence that we want to pass to enforcement. Um, and the pace of change is such that as soon as those you know the, those field officers in the GLAA or police want to speak to people they're no longer in that town or city this pace almost... is a real change and it makes it very very difficult to use our normal due diligence systems because if someone is um, lying on the paperwork misdeclaring their identity um, and not not wanting to speak about the situation it's very difficult to unpack and yet simultaneously we are seeing a real rise in that threshold between vulnerability and exploitation in the community so so people who are not really able to look after themselves who are working few hours we suspect they may be having the money taken off them um, and when we are able to speak to them in interview and with translators present and so on there's clearly a significant rise in cash in hand working you know, I've had a, a large number of people complaining to me because my gum company makes deductions. And, you know, as, as a human rights practitioner, I was very worried at this news of deductions. Started to look into it and realised that the, the colleagues I was talking to, their previous employment in the UK had not paid any tax on national insurance, had not issued pay slips, had not issued anything other than cash in hand. And these guys were saying, why on earth are you taking some of my earnings away? It's not right. I don't need to pay pay tax. I didn't in my last place. Um, so we're, we're definitely seeing a significant rise in a cash economy for workers and a movement of workers that makes things much, much more um, prone to exploitation and much harder for us to create any sense of due diligence whatsoever. So I, I really do echo what, what Shane sees, albeit in a different part of the sector, I see exactly the same patterns. I mean, that's that's incredible because I, I I haven't come across cash payments in 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 you know in the last few years as 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 often as you're mentioning it. So it's it's definitely a change. Um, Daryl or David, would you like to come back on on what Shane and Mel have said? So it, are you seeing something similar? The new models that are being exploited, new ways of uh, uh, cashing in on this uh, opportunity for labour exploitation? Yeah, I'm happy to come in. Um, I, I'd just like to highlight, having worked both with Mel and Shane for years, that these are two real 
experts at understanding hidden exploitation and how to address these uh, within your business. The vast majority of businesses don't have individuals with the skill and uh, expertise and experience of Shane and Mel to uh, identify these practices, so they will be continuing under the radar. Um, we are in a situation of uh, desperate labour shortages. I was on a, uh, an industry call um, this morning hearing from the, the, the meat industry with individuals being poached at factory gates uh, for higher offers um, and kind of going to the site being promised this and leaving, you know, and this this supports the um, the, the the cash economy, um, you know, uh, and the ability to uh, lure people away um, for uh, higher rewards. And this is across, um, you know, all sectors, whether it's fresh produce, flowers, um, meat, poultry, uh, the whole the whole of the food supply chain. And there is um, no immediate short, no immediate solution in sight. So this is um, this is what we are going to be living with for some time. So it's important um, that we focus on what we can do to address this. Um, of course, um, the government can help by providing certainty on the future of uh, the seasonal workers scheme that's important for the industry to know as early as possible how many will be uh, uh, available uh, next year and in years to come. Uh, there should be, and there is, um, but I think there should be increased um, multi-stakeholder focus on uh, that sector. There are different experiences um, uh, from uh, the seasonal worker scheme recruiters in recruiting from Nepal uh, to um, uh, Ukraine to uh, Belarus and understanding um, uh, patterns of um, exploitation that can happen further down the supply chain without the recruiters having awareness of this is um, is something that has been experienced and something that we need to focus on in future. How we prevent, as Shane raised, how we prevent individuals having to go into debt, having to take loans from uh, black market providers to be able to pay the initial upfront travel and visa fees to come into the scheme that's an important area to address how we open up um, channels for workers to be able to uh, uh, and with trust report issues that they are experiencing um, there are many issues that we can uh, still address within that seasonal worker scheme i would say um, that on the whole it's the current design of it is significantly enhanced on the old seasonal agricultural worker scheme, but there is more to do. And uh, and having uh, open, honest, multi-stakeholder conversations with NGOs, with government, with industry representatives to be able to address those issues is important. We find um, receiving um, uh, answers from the Home Office challenging. I think that's uh, somewhat of an understatement. Uh, it would be, uh, yeah, I think there's uh, um, there, there, that that significantly can be improved. Let's put it that way. Um, but uh, there are other aspects that we also need to address. Um, Dame Sarah Thornton's report. Or was 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 a challenge to the industry to respond, uh, and what industry should do to prevent another operation for it. it, it I I was well hugely upset and angry that it had happened 
within this sector where I believe we do more than than any other sector in the country but it happened and we've got to learn from that and I still see you know I see good companies like Chains and Mel's engaging with it maybe top 10 percent really engaging really well another 10 percent okay but then I see a huge sector of business still not engaging now we are doing work uh, in the ALP together with the GLAA to seek uh, to drive better engagement with um, the supermarkets to drive engagement. But there's a lot more businesses need to understand the risks uh, and need to put in place the good practice. So there's still huge amounts more uh, that needs to be done. OK, thank you very much. Um, and I've got two questions, but I'll start with the first one for Sarah. Um, so we have a question here. Are we doing enough to lobby government to increase the 30,000 uh, source work permits? Uh, is that the one that you were happy to answer, Sarah? It wasn't actually. It was the question about the NRM. Yeah. I, I'm happy to take that first one. Um, uh, well, <laughs> I'll, I'll take that first one. So, um, I know that lots of activity has taken place, huge amounts of activity between industry representative bodies with the Home Office, with DEFRA, to present significant amounts of evidence um, with regard to uh, the scheme. Of course, there are uh, the scheme operates Red Bull Horticulture. There are other other sectors who would wish the um, uh, the seasonal worker scheme, uh, understandably, to be extended into their sectors. There's a, there's an issue about numbers. There's an issue about how many scheme operators uh, has enough been done. Well, I suppose the answer is there that we don't have an answer yet. So no. And we're going to have to do more and we're going to have to be louder about the impact on um, UK food security, on delivery of product to um, our retail and hospitality sectors uh, uh, in, in, and, and, and moving into um, uh, the, the sort of other sectors, the impact on uh, animal welfare that we're seeing from labour shortages at the moment. Um, so there is more that needs to be done. Um, uh, there needs to be engagement with the task force that for a few days Michael Gove was heading up. It's now Stephen Barclay, um, the, uh, the Save Christmas task force that it's being called uh, to ensure that um, uh, the, the, the turkey sector can deliver turkeys and, uh, and, and businesses um, supplying all the other uh, accompanying months can supply that to our, to our tables. I have never heard such despair and concern in businesses' voices as I've heard over the last few weeks about how they're going to run their businesses yeah okay before before i open the questions of um up from the the people that have sent them in i've just got one question for daryl daryl um so if you're i mean what are you thinking from what you're hearing from from uh, the panelists at the moment how how, how complicated is it for you um uh, at the GLAA and the GLA to, to try to get a hold of the situation with regards to work and and also if you're a, a UK company uh, and you're using the services of a, a recruitment company abro abroad what would you expect in terms of um, due diligence around those labour agencies? Yeah <clears throat> well I think it becomes more complicated as I mentioned about starting to use uh, other overseas comp uh, companies in other countries that have been mentioned, the Ukraine, Belarus and, and so on, uh, where we've had little or low um, contacts and trying to develop those contacts ourselves. I just Whilst we wait here, I've just got an email from somebody in the FCO to try to give me a contact in the Ukraine that I need to speak to there. So it becomes more complicated in trying to make those 
links ourselves. And if it's difficult for us to make contact with uh, our opposite numbers in in, uh, in government, then it's obviously you know more difficult for businesses to satisfy themselves that the company that they are going to be working with um, is operating legitimately under the labour laws in that in that country. So it is very difficult. And, and I mean, on the point of in terms of payment, then clearly what we wouldn't want to see and what we want to check for um, is whether any of the workers that are recruited have actually paid fees to the company, irrespective of what the company may have said to the, um, the UK company it's working with. And clearly that's going to be part of the due diligence that that UK company's got to do and may not really be able to do effectively until those workers have arrived in the UK where they need to look at how they're going to objectively and, uh, and discreetly um, do a sample interview with some of those workers to find out what their circumstances were and whether they have um, been through an exploitative recruitment process and paid fees that they shouldn't have done. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, one of the UK companies that I was talking to recently, um, they, they were up in Scotland, um, was saying, this, what's stopping us from going abroad? I mean, they, I agree with David, actually, there is a sense of desperation when you're speaking to businesses at the moment. and you know, they're, they're really up against uh, the wall with this, but they're, they're kind of saying, you know, what's going to stop me going abroad and recruiting workers myself? Because I can't trust the, the, the perhaps the labor intermediaries. I have to do all that due diligence. What is stopping companies from going abroad and trying to recruit themselves? Well, in one sense, nothing, because they can go over there. But in the other sense, as, as, as occurred in the case in 2008, um, a, a UK company was doing just that and found itself on the wrong side of the Bulgarian Labour Inspectorate that was therefore then um, taking that through their their investigation processes for not being established properly in the in the Bulgarian uh, uh, authority area. So so mm -hmm. anybody that goes okay. abroad, they need to understand what they need to do to be compliant with the the labour law framework in that country so that they don't find themselves uh, in an awkward situation themselves. Yeah. Shane, did I see you put your hand up there? Yeah, one of the major challenges we have in the food industry for going abroad and recruiting is I don't think there's a route for us to actually do that at the moment, unless we're a sponsored business and we're on the shortage um, labour list, because we can't get the 70 points, which is uh, required. So anybody that we're fetching over that's after the 30th of June, we're doing it illegally. So uh, I certainly wouldn't advise that, everyone. <laughs> yeah, Christina, that, that's okay. that's what's stopping that, that's what's stopping business. The immigration system has changed, so you can't do it anymore unless the individuals ha already have pre-settled uh, or settled status. To be able to recruit abroad, you can only recruit uh, skilled workers. You need to have a tier. You need to have a tier two operator's license to do that, and there are quite some considerable costs in recruiting uh, through that scheme. And of course, you need to ensure that you are not discriminating in doing so. So it's quite a lot that uh, uh, there's quite a lot of hurdles to uh, to get across. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. It was worth pointing out. I don't. I don't think there is that awareness as widely as we need it to be just yet. Uh, I don't think the mindset's changed in, in some businesses. Okay, I'm gonna take some questions from um, uh, for the panel. So the first one is to uh, Sarah Thornton. So the question is, previously to Brexit, EU applications to the NRM had a high chance of success, whereas third country nationals had an 80% uh, prospect of refusal. And this might be attributed to the hostile environment uh, with a culture of disbelief, perceiving people may be taking advantage of the system. Do you anticipate that EU arrivals arriving post-Brexit, therefore not eligible under EUSS for status, will also be subject to the hostile environment leading to high refusals under the NRM and as an immigration lawyer I would be interested in your thoughts on this. This is for Sarah. So thank you very much Christina. When I saw that data I started to scurry across to my other computer and looked at the, the data um, in our annual report because I, I, I wasn't certain that it was correct and, and, and it's not. Um, 
there's always been a view that the uh, uh, the granting of conclusive grounds that somebody is a victim of trafficking was much uh, higher for UK and EU than it was for the rest of the world. While there has been a difference, that difference has been closing over recent years. And I just quickly did the calculations on the 2020 data. And if you're looking at the conclusive grounds, uh, non-EEA, um, because it's the whole of the economic area, 83% positive, um, EEA 88%. So actually in 2020, there was only a 5% difference. So it's not the case that there's a massive, massive difference. Um, and my point would be, it's absolutely essential that those decisions about trafficking are made independent of any concerns about immigration. So completely with you on the principle, but, but the data is, is, is a lot better than it used to be. However, there's, there is a real but coming. What has happened previously is that uh, victims of trafficking who've had a positive conclusive grounds, although it can take a very long time, if they're not UK nationals, very often they were able to seek asylum in this country or some other form of humanitarian leave and stay. The difficulty is going to be for those from the EU or in fact the EEA who haven't got either settled or pre-settled status, um, they have no right to stay in this country. And of course, they come from countries from whom asylum is inappropriate because you can't make out the case that it's dangerous for people to go back to, to countries in, in Europe. So I think there's going to be a, a real crunch point at some point in the future where people have been trafficked to this country, maybe have been here for quite a long time in very abusive, exploitative situations, are eventually eventually escape from that maybe even there's a prosecution but in fact they then have no right to stay in this country so I, I do think we've got a looming problem with that kind of nexus between trafficking and uh, immigration status okay thank you very much that's going to make everything very complicated going forward um Okay, um, in terms of I mean we've only got a few minutes left I mean what I would like to do is just to get some opinions from all of you really about what you think is possible for businesses to do in terms of reducing their risks uh, around um, the the recruitment of labor and potential exploitation. I have seen massive wage hikes and I'm really worried in some areas that um, you know there is there is a, a desperate moment for businesses to try to keep their costs down because the supply chains are so tight at every level and i don't know who whether it was shane or mel that was saying it earlier but there is that risk that you know we are going to try to get the numbers in to do the work uh, as soon as possible and perhaps not do the due diligence that we need to do as businesses so what what kind of advice or what what are your parting thoughts if you like um before we we end today about what businesses can do um, i was going to say it's for me it's really simple the the one thing that all businesses can do is encourage their suppliers and their peers and their customers to recognize and reward those companies who actually look into exploitation who raise the issue who challenge the norms and not criticize or condemn we need to find a way of making sure that when issues are flagged and raised, the businesses are supported and the victims are supported um, because at the moment the vocabulary we have is very negative and um, there's there's a competitive disincentive for businesses to be good practitioners in this space. So we just need to really encourage each other. We need to prioritise transparency and honesty um, and just say no one's immune from these challenges. As businesses, we're all in the same mix of risk and worry. Hmm. Okay. Thank you. So, so um, I think that's that's massively complicated, actually, from what I've seen. Um, David, would, any anything from you? What would you say? Yeah, nice easy one here. Go to the ALP website, the Help Centre and Due Diligence. There's loads. Uh, there's no. There's not. There's a few, but there are. There is guidance on due diligence um, for all businesses. Um, straightforward laid out with links to other support. There's um, core score checklists uh, available there. There's free training at Stronger Together. 
there's uh, free access to responsible uh, recruitment tools at uh, Responsible Recruitment Toolkit for uh, uh, all suppliers in the supermarket supply chains in the UK. Uh, the guidance is out there. Businesses uh, need to start using it. Uh, and, uh, and that's the incentive that we're seeking to make through something called the Compliance Maturity Framework which is uh, Dame Sarah's um, uh, initiative, uh, which we've taken and applied to labour providers and through the training uh, that we're providing for the whole uh, food supply chain together with uh, the GLAA. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Sarah? Just a thought about um thinking about these most egregious cases of slavery and forced labour, it seems to me the best way to tackle them is to think about decent work right across the board. So whether that's, you know, payment of decent wages, whether that's sick pay, the health and safety, having proper contracts, not cash in hand, all of those issues, in my view, are linked. And if we're serious about worker welfare and decent work, then I think we'll go a long way to eradicating those most serious risks of forced labour, modern slavery. Uh, Shane? Yeah, similar similar point to what um, uh, Dame Sarah and, and Mel had, had stated. That this is a societal problem that's manifesting itself in the workplace. Um, so we've got a couple of uh, angles that need to be tackled here. One, um, we need to be dealing with whatever we can to um, reduce the risk from a societal perspective. That's obviously going to sit within government and whatever we can do to lobby that. Um, but with, we have to take responsibility within our own businesses. Um, now, naming and shaming businesses won't help because that will just reduce collaboration because their businesses will just clam up. That's just how they'll work. Um, so uh, we do need to re um, ensure that businesses are aware of the different risks that are manifesting themselves and that we are openly sharing the ways in which we can tackle those risks. Now, um, the ALP do this very well with some of the work that they've, they've got on their um, websites. There are a number of other um, groups, whether that be FNET, MSIN, um, or, or other organizations that are starting to, to, to share the information. But most important thing a business can do is get awareness and training to the lowest levels in their business. This doesn't affect us at middle management or higher management levels. This is affecting our workers. And therefore, the, the, because it's likely to affect illegal workers more, they're not going to come forward. We need to rely on those around them, working directly with them, to have the relevant communication methods to be able to get that exploitation identified and reported to us so we can look after the welfare of our workers. If we don't make it a great place to work, by improving their safety and also doing what we can do to make it the right place to work by having our integrity. We're, we're going to be on a fast path down to um, some very, very low levels of employment. Okay, thank you. And last but not least, Daryl. Um, yeah, I mean, one of the things that was said was about raising the wages of the workers, which is going to get them out of the clause of exploitation. But um, don't, don't, um, kid yourself that just raising the wages will get them out, out of that. You need to make sure that what you think you're paying them is what they're actually receiving and there isn't somebody that's into uh, space themselves with, between the relationship so that they actually control the money going into the accounts and actually you've not checked the, uh, the records of the workers and more than one worker has the same bank account and they don't have control over it. Well, I think we are here at five o'clock. And uh, I just wanted to say thank you very much for all of you for coming on here today and for being part of the panel. It's been hugely interesting. I think this is going to be a very challenging few years. But uh, again, I, I would concur that if we focus on creating the right circumstances for people to be working in and the right frameworks, it, it could definitely go a long way uh, in addressing some of these issues. Thank you very much uh, for being here. Um, so, um, this is the end of this webinar, I think we've got a little slide coming up, um, this is, we've got those slide. here we go. So, um, we, we'll be sharing a link uh, to this uh, social media platform in due course, so uh, if you want to share this webinar with anyone else, they can access it when they want. 
The next webinar in this series will take place on the 14th of October and it will be a blended event at the Wilberforce Institute and uh, online and it will be given by Professor Douglas Hamilton on enslaved revolts and the Royal Navy in the Caribbean circa 1790 to 1832. Following on from uh, him on Thursday, the 28th of October, as part of Black History Month, we have Karen Okra, Chandler Saint, Robert Forbes, and Professor David Richardson talking about lessons from the Venture Smith project. And finally, on Thursday, the 11th of November, we have Alex Renton, uh, author of Blood Legacies, alongside Cecil Oxal and Karen Okra, giving a webinar on genealogies of the Caribbean diaspora. So thank you very much to all of you again for uh, joining us today. And um, please uh, feel free to share the link to the webinar and th uh, that's taking place. Thank you very much.